Hello everyone, welcome to this global GEG broadcast. We'll be making a start shortly, and while we're waiting for everyone to arrive, why not head into the chat, let us know who you are, where you're from, your Twitter handle, and if you've got any questions that you'd like us to answer during the course of this evening, let us know there as well. Also, if you haven't already done so, make sure you hit that subscribe button to make sure you stay up to date with all of the events being organised by us at Global GEG. We'll be making a start really soon. Thanks for joining us. All right, everybody. Hello, hello, hello. My name is Pav Session, and I am here with you today uh, to run Making Meaningful Video Content for the Music Classroom. Now, I would like to start by letting everybody know that uh, this session is not specific to music teachers only. Um, if you are not a music teacher, you can definitely use a lot of the information I'm giving you, uh, and it can be reapplied to uh, other types of uh, course matter as well. So I am going to begin by sharing my screen. And I am going to start with uh, right out with making meaningful video content for the music classroom. So throughout the presentation tonight, if you would like to follow along, you can go to gavinzo.com. That's gavinzo.com slash session 24. Uh, and you can have access to this slide deck even after the show is finished. But I want you to have access to it so that you can uh, click on some of the links as we go through our video today. So for those people who don't know who I am, my name is Gavin Foster, a.k.a. Gav Session. I am a music teacher from Belleville, Ontario, Canada, um, and I have been a music teacher for approximately 15 years. Uh, I am a Google certified level one and two educator. I am a Google certified trainer. I am a soundtrack expert. I'm a Flipgrid ambassador, and I am a leader of both global GEG and my local GEG here in Ontario. So since March, I have been rather busy teaching people all over the planet, all kinds of different googly things. Uh, and that's who I am. So if you would like to reach out to me, all of my contact info is on this page. And of course you can always grab it from gavinzo.com slash session 24 uh, and pick up all of these things. So before we get started today, the first thing I'd like you to do is I would like everyone to join me on a jam board. So I would like you to go to gavinzo.com slash video jam, and it's going to open up this jam board here. And you'll notice that when I ran this session the other day, uh, they pretty much filled up my first page for me. So I have a second page here that you guys can go to. And I would like you to go to the um, <clears throat> sticky note page, create a sticky note, type in whatever you need to type in. And then this is going to pop up right on the screen. And you're going to tell me why is video content not meaningful to students generally? So why is it that video content isn't really meaningful to students? And after you've done that, I'm going to have you skip to my next page here, which is what kind of things can't be captured effectively on video? What kind of lessons can you not capture effectively on video? And again, uh, my last seminar kind of filled this page, so I've left you guys a blank one right after it as well. And you scroll through the pages up at the top here. So I am going to give you a grand total of three minutes to fill out these two pages for me uh, and just let me know what you are thinking and uh, uh, what you can do with these jam boards to kind of fill them out. I'll be back in three minutes time.
All right, everybody. I am back. Thank you so much for that uh, that three minutes you did there. So it looks to me um, like I have uh, a little bit of content. People have said that one of the reasons that students uh, don't find video content meaningful is that they're just inundated with video content all the time. So there's no way to sort of sort out what's meaningful and what's not. Uh, the other thing is that a lot of videos are just too long and they don't want to sit through all of that time to watch a video. And they're just not engaging to them. Um, what can't effectively be captured on video are things like the relationship that you have with your students. Or as a musician, the relationship that you have to your instrument and to the people in your set and in your band or orchestra or your choir, yeah, capturing that relationship is really, really complicated. So what I am going to do today, I hope, uh, is show you guys a few different ways of creating some meaningful video things that you could um, use in different ways to, to, to bring out video content in your classroom. So, oops. Um, so what I want to start out with today is letting you know, here's what we're going to learn. So I'm going to show you how to create videos where you yourself are the star. I'm going to show you how to create videos of your computer screen so students can see what's happening on your screen. Uh, I'm going to give you a couple of tips, I hope, on how to make video more meaningful to your students. And I'm going to show you what to do with that whole pile of videos once you've got them. Where are you going to put them all? Where are you going to store them? How are your kids going to access them later on? So we're going to be using a variety of tools today. So I'm going to be using Flipgrid, Screencastify, School Video Recorder for Google Drive, and Unscreen. Now, if you're not familiar with any of these programs, if you go to my slide deck, gavinzo.com slash session 24, um, right from the slide deck, you can click on any one of these images here, and it will take you right to the website or, uh, um, or the Google Play Store to download some of these programs so that you can use them. Now, when I talk about where the videos are going to go, I'm going to show you how to store them in your Google Classroom as materials for your students. I'm going to show you, oh, that's a typo, how to put them on your Google Classroom Google site so that you're going to be able to put it on a website. And I'm going to show you how to embed them in a HyperDoc. If you don't know what any of those things are, again, right from the slide deck here, you can click on the link and go to either the website or the Play Store to download them. So here's what I'm going to cover tonight. Hopefully I can do it all in the next 50 minutes. So I've got creating an instrumental exemplar, leaving powerful explanations for your guest teachers or your supply teachers. Now this is a touchy subject, conducting on tape via video. I'll talk about it when we get there. Curating meaningful video links for your students. So rather than you making all these videos, how do you go about and curate good content for them. And then this one, try not to laugh at me, is creating GIFs with practical applications. I actually dared somebody in an earlier session in May uh, to come up with a valuable reason to use GIFs in a classroom, and they proved me wrong and created so many cool GIFs that it just exploded my mind, and I've got a few cool ways to use GIFs in your classroom. We're going to talk about that right at the end. So where I want to get started today, oh, and there's a, um, an overlay on top of me here. I'm going to have you guys go to my first Flipgrid link there, which you can pop up on the screen for me. So that one there, the flipgrid.com slash E1B03B56, it is going to take you to one of my Flipgrid pages, and it looks like this. And so if you get there, this is something I used for my grade five students who are playing recorders uh, and they're doing a program called the Recorder Ninjas where the kids have to uh, take different belts. It's based on karate. Uh, and so when they get their orange belt, they have to play this, uh, this example. So this is, and we'll see if the video works, this is the audio example of me playing an audio exemplar for my kids. So things to pay attention to in that video. I was right centered in the camera, so I wasn't way off to the side or turning sideways. My hands were visible at all times, so the students could see my fingering, they could see what I was doing, and I was sitting as close to upright as I possibly could. Now, fancy equipment. I don't have a fancy webcam or a fancy microphone. I was using the webcam and the microphone built into my laptop at school. 
So it's nothing fancy to create that. This is a program called Flipgrid. It doesn't have, you know, the most perfect audio CD quality, 4K sound quality you can imagine, but that worked. The kids heard the song, they knew what it was. Now, the other thing I do along with this video clip is I have a link right inside my um, Flipgrid here that takes my students to a Google Drive that has all the stuff they need to be successful. So, as well as that video clip that I just showed you, I have a bad video clip. So in this video clip, my head is facing sideways. In this video clip, you can't see my fingers. In this video clip, the audio is pretty nasty. Number 37. My students actually complained about this video because they said they couldn't see my fingers, they couldn't see what was going on. So then I really got thinking about meaningful video and how to change it. The other thing I give my students, of course, is the sheet music. So they can actually take this and work on it and they can play on it and they can print it themselves. They can you know, mock up the screen however they want to. But for each of my little recorder belts, they have a Google Drive link with the, the sheet music and the audio clip of what they got. And if you haven't used Flipgrid before, uh, one of the things that's amazing about Flipgrid is when my students submit their video to me, it's private, nobody can see it but me, but Flipgrid now has this amazing feedback tool built right into it where I can put in my, the success criteria for whatever I'm teaching that week. So if I'm really focusing on their embouchure or their fingers, or I'm really focusing on tone quality or whether they're you know, adhering to rests and note values, I can put that all in the rubric. And while the student's video is playing, I can just sit there with my mouse and go check, 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 and check off everything that I needed them to do. I can provide them audio, video, or written feedback and return it right to the student and no one ever has to see it but me. Really great easy way for my students to submit tests and things to me. All right, so, a couple of simple tips that I've already given you. One, make sure yourself, make sure you're centered in the frame and you're head on in the frame. Two, make sure that your hands are visible so they can see them. So what I'm gonna do now, um, I just got a note in the comments that said maybe three minutes is too long. So I'll try three minutes for this one. And if it's too long, I'll shorten them going forward. But I'm going to give you three more minutes and you have sort of two options. You can either go into that Flipgrid page that I showed you before. Hopefully you're still on it. And if you're still there, you can uh, try out just making a Flipgrid video like you're a student. If you have an instrument kicking around, I don't, you don't have to obviously play the test. But if you have a ukulele or a bongo or something kicking around and you want to just send a video to that uh, platform to try it as a student, go right ahead. If not, I have another jam board you can go to, which is gavinzo.com slash tips one. Uh, and on this jam board, I'm looking for pluses and deltas for making good instrumental exemplars. So again, if you flip back a page, you'll see some of the things I got in my previous session. So what are some things you can definitely do to make good instrumental exemplars? And what are some things that you may have noticed need to change if you've made them before and they've bombed? So these are sort of pluses and deltas of how to make good instrumental exemplars. So again, I'll give you three minutes to try that out and I'll be right back. You can either look at the Flipgrid page or you can try out the exemplars.
All right, everybody. Thank you so much for taking that time to uh, to play. Hopefully, I'll be able to go in and check out uh, some of the videos as soon as I, uh, I stop presenting here today. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is leaving powerful explanations for guest teachers. So when I do that, I use a program called School Video Recorder for Google Drive. Uh, and what I want you to do for me is if you'll go to gavinzo.com slash guest notes, you're going to see what I typically leave for a supply teacher when I'm not there. So I like to leave video instructions for all of my supply teachers so that when my students come in and sit down, they see a face they're not overly familiar with. Uh, the teacher goes, you know, hi, I'm Mr. and Miss so-and-so. Here's a note from your teacher. And they hit a button and my face comes up on the smart board and tells my students what the day is like. So this is kind of an example of what one of those things uh, looks like. Hi there, everybody. I can't be here today. I am actually at a funeral today, unfortunately. Um, but I've left you two options. So you have a choice. I know you guys have a test coming up where you guys are playing um, bar five through 21 of Power Rock. So uh, if your supply teacher is up for it, I'm going to give you guys the whole day to practice if you need it. Uh, and just remember, you've only got bar five to bar 21. So if you can hear it, this is it here. That's it. That's bar five to twenty-one. So let's see how well you guys do with that. If you have any questions, please send me an email. I'll help you out. Otherwise, if that doesn't work, I have some C work for you guys to do today. So best of luck, and I'll talk to you guys tomorrow. Remember, your test is due on the twenty-seventh, Monday, the twenty-seventh of January, and don't play anything for your test that has um, stomping and clapping in it. So skip over those parts and just play the notes. Thanks, guys. See you later. So obviously that's not, you know, the exact video you're going to leave for people because you have to have been in my class doing my thing. Um, but I leave all of those notes for my supply teachers when I'm not there. So here's what it kind of looks like uh, for me. So first of all, um, I, if you'd like to go to, uh, I think it's gavinzo.com slash supply T, you'll get a copy of what my supply plans look like that I leave. And so you're able to steal that and make a copy for yourself and keep it. Um, but I try to leave really clear explanations. And then if there is success criteria, you leave it in the video so the students and the supply teacher know what they're doing. So this is a, a typical sample of what one of my supply plans looks like. So it's all got, um, you know, lorem ipsum Latin text in it right now. But basically for every class, I leave the safety behavior plans that I have for that class, the seating plan for that class, and then my video instruction. So when I leave, I leave this up on the smart board in my classroom and my supply teacher can actually read my notes, click the video instruction, and it goes live to my students right in front of them. Uh, every once in a while too, I do one of those, hey, I see you back there, Mark, stop, stop fooling around. I throw one of those and they think I'm actually watching them. It's really awesome. Um, but uh, yeah, this is how I leave supply plans for my teachers. Now, last time I did this session, somebody asked me like, you know, how do you do this? Like, what if you're sick? How do you do this in five minutes in the morning? So first of all, in September, I make a few emergencies. I make a few like I can't lift my head off the pillow emergencies where all I have to do is just basically put the date in and send it. And I do that. one. Um, but generally speaking, if it's like the video you saw where I was at a funeral or if, you know, one of my kids is sick or something like I can usually whip one of these off pretty quickly. So what I also normally do is right at the start of the year, once I get my schedule, I build blank templates. So I build like a day one, day two, day three, day four template and I have them all already with what class I'm going to, what period I'm going to, who's the teacher, what room number they're in. Uh, and then really it's just putting the plans in uh, and then making the video. I can make a video on my computer with school video recorder in like 15 seconds if I need to. So anyway, you're welcome to steal that supply plan if you want it. If you don't, then ignore it. Um, so what I am going to have you guys do is I'm going to give you two minutes this time, real short. I'm going to give you two minutes if you want to go to uh, G-A-V-I-N-Z-O slash, and it's big letters, 
school video recorder for Google Drive, S V R F G D. If you go there, it'll take you right to the Google Play Store to download school video recorder for Google Drive. Uh, and if you want to try that out, you can do it in the next two minutes, download it real quick and try it with your webcam. It doesn't take long at all to make a video. It saves right into your Google Drive, saves in WebM format. So it's a really, really small video. It's not going to take up a lot of space or a lot of bandwidth. And if you don't feel like doing that, you can go to Jamboard and go to gavinzo.com slash tips two. Uh, and tips two board is what are pluses and deltas to actually leaving guest teacher notes, to actually leaving guest teacher videos. And again, if you want to read some of the previous things that have been said by some other people who've taken this same seminar, that's on page one. And page two is blank if you want to talk about what are the pluses and deltas for actually leaving uh, supply teacher videos. So I'm going to stop this when it gets to one minute instead of zero. So I'm going to give you two minutes to work on it. You got two minutes. So here we are back again. Thank you so much for taking the time to do that. So what I want to talk about next. Um, now this, as I said, is a touchy subject for some people, but I want to look at um, doing conducting with your students. Now I'm talking about beginning instrumentalists. So I'm talking for me, it's my first year instrumentalists teaching them some conducting. So this is not a high school thing. Your high school kids are probably beyond this, but the way I started doing conducting is I have a recording of an audio file that a band plays and I have the students actually record themselves conducting to a video, which I know is weird and conducting on a tape. So what I'm going to have you do is if you go to flipgrid.com slash conduct, it's going to take you to this page and you're going to watch me and I'm not going to show you the whole thing because it's like three and a half minutes, but I'm going to show you how I conduct uh, what I want the kids to do for their assignment. So the students are going to basically turn on their phone or if they have like a, like a, gonna do a video computer speaker in their bedroom and they're going to conduct so to the audio to file. And how to cue everybody. So here we go. Now I also ask them to work on cueing. So not just conducting, but I want you to cue over there and I want you to cue over here and I want you to show that they're paying attention. Now, I discovered making this video that conducting to a tape is really hard and kind of sucks. But um, it was a really interesting exercise for the kids because I got them to, to um, 
practice some of the some of the actual conducting moves with their arms and i got them to work on cueing and what i also got them to do is mark up a score so again using flipgrid i have a whole list here of materials so i'm not going to go through in painstaking detail but basically what i have for the students that's available to them is the audio copy the mp3 of the file I've got, I had a really small band class that year. So I've got a um, layout for what my band class looks like, you know, flutes, clarinets, saxes, trumpets, low brass percussion. They can kind of see each other. I have a simple diagram of the conducting pattern so the kids can remember up, down, left, right. I've got, for some reason, two copies of the video of me conducting. I don't know why it's in there twice. And I have my uh, Power Rock score. So I have the students to be able to go in and mark up the score if that is something uh, that they need to do. So that was what I uh, did to get them started. So what I'm going to have you guys do is if you can go back to that, um, that link, which is gavinzo.com slash conduct, I am going to give everybody two minutes to go in and see if you can do it. You're sitting at your computer. See if you can open up the conducting materials and find the mp3 audio file should because you're sitting right there double click on it it'll play and see if you can jump back to your flipgrid page and actually record yourself doing a little bit of conducting uh to that song and see what it feels like to conduct uh via tape via video um i'm only going to give you about two minutes so you won't get through the whole song because the whole song is about a minute and 40 seconds i think but see what you can do just to get started about conducting with it i'll be back in two minutes there i am two minutes and i will uh, i'll go over some of the pluses and deltas i had uh with this assignment but go through and give it a try and see what you think All right, I am back, everybody. So um, I am looking here at uh, the next slide, which is talking about pluses and deltas of conducting to tape. So here's sort of the plus side. So you kind of eliminate the inexperienced musician error. So I don't have students that are good enough players to react appropriately to a conductor. So if the student conductor is speeding up or slowing down, my band's not really going to watch them anyway, and they're going to just keep chugging through whatever speed the drummer's doing. Um, so you kind of eliminate that. You're not going to, you're not going to, you don't have players strong enough to do what you want them to do when you're learning to conduct. Uh, two, it's really easy for them to practice. It's not so easy if you got a class of 30 kids to give each kid conducting practice time in front of the group. But if they're, if they're conducting to a tape, they can practice 100 times. Uh, three, you have no element of 
surprise. So as a conductor, um, you have to be ready to roll with surprises. But if this is your, you know, 12 year olds first time ever conducting, there's going to be no surprise. No kid's going to like start playing the wrong song or, you know, your, your kids aren't going to suddenly switch instruments on each other and try to play different things. The music is always going to do what they expect it to do. So they just have to kind of go along with it. Now, what are the deltas to it? Obviously it's, it's an unrealistic experience for the conductor. If you are actually conducting, as musicians know, your, your orchestra, your choir responds to you and reacts to you. So if you're just conducting to a tape, that's not really what it feels like. Um, you also have no control as a conductor if you're conducting to a tape. You can't quiet the group down or make the group louder or speed them up or slow them down. But what you can do is you can get to know the music really well and say, this is where it speeds up. This is where it slows down. This is where it gets louder or softer. And you can make those adjustments in your conducting as a student. Um, so I really liked that the students were able to learn some of the tricks of conducting that the inexperienced musicians couldn't really give them as players. So they could work on, you know, bringing their hands in and they could work on bringing their body language down to conduct softer. So it's not perfect by any stretch of the imagination, but it was a cool video assignment where the kids got to videotape themselves. And I saw kids in all kinds of weird, like I saw one kid like lying back on their bed conducting like because they had mounted their phone above themselves. I saw ample kids sitting cross-legged on the floor trying to conduct. So it was interesting, that, you know, and then most of them were standing upright the way I want them to, but it was just an interesting way for me to look at that particular part of my curriculum was having the kids work that way. All right, the next thing I want to talk about is video that's not yours, video that you don't make. So how do you curate meaningful video links for students? So I want to talk about YouTube playlists. So if you haven't used them before, YouTube playlists are awesome because they're a single link that you share to your students and it's just a playlist. So in that link, you see all kinds of important things. So I'm going to talk about this a little later, but if you go to gavinzo.com slash YT playlist, you're going to see a playlist that I made my students. And this is for day one of learning to play an instrument. So rather than just coming out as a teacher and pulling every instrument off my shelf and opening up the case and showing it to my kids, I send the kids home the night before and I say, here's day one, lesson one, flute, day one, lesson one, clarinet, day one, lesson one, alto sax, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And the students can sit and watch these videos. They're all pretty short, like three minutes, three minutes, three and a half minutes. Uh, there's a couple of 10 minute ones in there, but they're just they're The kids can zip through them four minute ones where the people actually open the box. So you can see the size of the box and how big the instrument is. They put the instrument together and they make the first few sounds. That's really all the kids need when they're looking at an instrument for the first time. What does it look like? How big is it? What does it sound like? Um, and that's what all these videos are. So my students go and watch all of these videos so I don't have to sit there and spend an entire class pulling every instrument out of the shelf and putting it together and showing them how it works because I'm going to lose their attention on that pretty fast after 40 minutes. But this way they can just watch it at their leisure, come back the next day. I'm like, okay, who watched the videos? You watched them? Good. What, what interests you? What do you like? What sounded good? What do you definitely not like after seeing that video? Uh, they generally have some idea. But if I just tell the students, Go to YouTube and Google, you know, lesson one with a flute. I'm pretty sure they're going to find some stuff you don't want them watching. If they're just Googling, you know, first day with a flute, you're going to watch some kid like, you know, fishing with it or doing something horribly inappropriate. And so this way I've curated all of these links and all I've done with the students is share them the playlist and they have the eight videos right there in front of them. So using YouTube playlists as a way to curate video content for your kids is pretty awesome. Now, a couple of tips. Number one, watch every single video clip in its entirety before you give it to your kids. There are some trolls out there. There are some videos that look great for the first 90 seconds. And then when you get bored as a teacher and turn it off, there is some weird stuff at the end of those videos. So just make sure you curate and pre-watch all your videos. Um, take it from me, the shorter the video clip, the better. It's better to give your kids nine short clips than one huge long clip. 
because they will they will lose interest in it. So even that link, that list I just showed you, I've got a couple of 10 minute videos on there. I'm always on the lookout for a shorter two or three minute video for those instruments that I can show because 10 minutes is just too long for my kids to sit through. Make sure whatever video you're showing your students in your playlist is immediately relevant to something they give a damn about. Don't just say like, okay guys, here's my YouTube playlist for the year and have, you know, a hundred videos in it. I curated those list of nine clips because I'm like, these are what you need today or tomorrow. Watch these nine clips. They're all fairly short, but you're going to need this information the next day. So don't give them a whole bunch of video clips that they may or may not need or that are kind of cool, but you don't really care about. Only give them stuff that's immediately relevant. All right. So the last thing I'm going to have you do, and I'm only going to give you one minute this time with Jamboard. You're going to get one minute on Jamboard tips three. The Jamboard tips three question are where else or where might you use YouTube playlists in your classroom? So I don't mean where are you going to use it like on my smart board, on my laptop. I mean, what types of subject areas, what types of lesson plans or what types of units are, are you think, oh, I could probably make a YouTube playlist to go along with my conductors unit or go along with my, you know, 20th century France unit, whatever it is you're doing. Um, where do you think you might be able to curate a, um, a set of videos and use YouTube playlists to help? So I'm going to give you one minute to go to gavinzo.com slash tips three, there I am, tips three uh, to fill out that video. You got one minute, everybody, one minute. everybody we are back so i noticed that not a lot of people watching are filling in my jam boards but that's okay you still have access to this slide deck till the end of time so if you feel like going in and adding something later by all means go on in and i will check them out and get back to you if you uh if you reach out to me so what i want to talk about now again i mentioned this at the beginning this kind of came out of a bet or a dare so if anyone has used screencastify before when you're all done with your video and you've made your screencast, one of the options you can do is download your video as a GIF. And I challenged a, a group of teachers I was presenting to, and I said, I have absolutely no reason to use GIFs in my classroom. I cannot see a practical reason for GIFs. Like, I, I just don't see it being practical. So I dare you to find a way to do it. And about a week or so later, uh, this guy wrote me back. He was a grade seven science teacher. And he was doing an experiment with his students with pulleys and gears. And he had set up all the apparatus for their science experiment using GIFs. So the kids could see like which pulley moved and which gear moved and how it worked. And they had this um, Google Doc, I think, with all these GIFs embedded. And I looked at it, I thought, this is genius. This is exactly what you want a GIF for. So I started playing around and came up with a few reasons why I might use animated GIFs. So the first one's kind of silly. I'll come to it in a minute. But the second one, I was showing students how to properly assemble instruments. And of course, I brought my clarinet out and I put the pieces together in different GIFs. So I actually have, I think, eight or nine different GIFs for how to put the clarinet together. And I could easily build a slide deck for all my clarinet players and share it out and be like, are you having trouble putting your reed on your mouthpiece? Let me show you this animated GIF of like putting the reed on, sealing it. And this is, they're like three second snippets. So you can't make a giant five minute video and make it a GIF. You can make these little three second things. So guys, you think I can't put a clarinet together, can't put a mouthpiece together in three seconds? Let me show you how to do it. So you do it, you put it, you make it. 
and then you put this gift that just scrolls on their page. And rather than the student rewatching a video over and over and over again, I actually had a comment come up earlier about one school district that totally blocks YouTube anyway for all their students. So if you build a GIF and throw it into Google Doc or into a Google slide, um, they can always just see your GIF over and over again. Now on the left-hand side, that little daffy picture of me waving my hand with my dorky music teacher shirt, um, that actually came from something that I saw on Twitter. Uh, I think most people now have been around long enough. You've heard about Bitmoji classrooms where you put your Bitmoji classroom up and your little Bitmoji there and your Bitmoji's like waving or smiling or something. Um, well, if you go to, uh, I think it's gavinzo.com slash classroom, you're going to end up here. And for those people that are working remotely and don't see their students, this animated GIF is a really awesome way to uh, put actually yourself out to your students. So if you can get a picture of your actual classroom with yourself standing in it, smiling, pointing, looking at something, waving to everybody, it's just sort of one more way to get those students who aren't with you right now because you're because you're working remotely to see you and to interact with you a little bit more. So it's just something, it's even just a tad more personal than, um, than a Bitmoji classroom. So if you go to gavinzo.com slash unscreen, that is a video that I made. All my videos are called Gav Sessions. That's a Gav session that I made on how to use unscreen to take a video of yourself like this and put it into your Bitmoji class. Get rid of your Bitmoji and actually put you in. Put a GIF of you doing something. Um, so it's not really hard. It's not hard to do at all. It's pretty cool. Gavinzo.com uh, slash jam gif is a jam board that I have for you that says, think of ways that you might be able to use gifs in your teaching. So for, I'm not going to, I don't want to, I don't want anyone to say putting instruments together because I already did that one, but maybe there's something else that your students ask you all the time. Like, I don't know how to do this, especially if it's something that you as a music teacher can do in two seconds and your kids ask you a thousand times a day. If it's like, hey, is my read on properly? What other things can you throw a GIF together of and share with your students? They can watch that GIF. That's kind of what I want you to throw into my Jam GIF Jam board. So <clears throat> I am uh, really enjoying these GIFs now. This is kind of what I've been doing for the last week is figuring out ways that I can put these GIFs right into slide decks or right into Google Docs with kids. Because um, I think... Even something simple, like let me just back up and show you the clarinet again. Something simple of the clarinet being put together where it just replays over and over and over again on loop at nausea. So if a student's trying to figure this out, they can just watch this GIF just restart over and over and over again. And I've been trying to think of things, um, you know, quite, and I feel like I'm going to have a little sticky note in front of me because I'm going back to school next week uh, with students. But I feel like I'm going to have a little sticky note on my on my music stand of things my students ask me a million times a day that I can to help them with or show them and I can do it in two seconds that I'm going to make gifts of that'll just replay and they can just watch me doing it for years instead of asking me over and over and over again. All right. So I'm going to give you another one minute right here to have a look at uh, the jam gif and try to fill in your givingzo.com slash jam gif and fill out reasons uh, or areas of your classroom uh, long range planning where you might want to incorporate gifts to make it work. I have noticed that there are not a lot of comments coming in on the comment window. I will be able to help you if you throw a comment in. If you have a question, please put it in the comment window. I'm happy to respond to you. I'll give you one minute uh, and then I'll come back and do the uh, last section, which is what you do with all these videos once you have them all. Where are you going to put them all? Where are you going to store them? I will do that uh, in about one minute. So I will see you in one minute.
right, so coming back here, I'm going to talk about what to do with all this video content once you've got it. So if you're busy making, um, you know, school video recorder for Google Drive videos, if you're busy using Screencastify, busy making all this Flipgrid stuff, where are you going to stash all these videos so your students aren't going to 100 different places to find them? So I'm going to start with Google Classroom. Now, unfortunately, I don't have a link for you here because it's my Google Classroom, but I'm going to show you what I do with it. Uh, I'm going to go into here, my training class. So if you're unfamiliar with this part of Google Classroom, when you go to add something in classwork, you don't just have to add an assignment or an announcement or you know something for your kids to do. You can just add in material. And if you have all this really cool, meaningful video content, you can put all your meaningful videos all together as nothing but material for your students to look at. So if you've been putting all these videos together all year for your students, and if your class has a Google Classroom, then just save it as material and give it the material a title. These are meaningful videos, or these are performance videos, or these are exemplar videos. Uh, and your students will be able to just scroll through their classwork page and get to the material that you have shared with them. So rather than trying to share, um, you know, having them go through their stream and be like, where, what assignment did that video come in on? You can repost all those videos just as um, material for them to use. Second, if you have a classroom website, you can simply just make a meaningful videos tab and throw all those videos on that website. So I um, will be using a classroom website this year, though I don't have one organized. This is one that I built for a training session. But you'll just kind of see, I'm not going to spend much time on the website. But if I scroll down, this is what a sample classroom website might look like. But I have my videos page which when you click on it, all of my important meaningful videos are just on that page and they're all clickable and they're all embedded right onto the page. So if you had videos that you wanted your parents to see, and of course parents don't easily have access to Google Classroom, or if you just had um, videos that you knew you wanted kids to access on a much easier basis by putting them in their own separate window on their web page, really easy to just click on and dive right into. Third thing I want to talk about is a hyperdoc. So if you have not had a lot of experience with hyperdocs, you should have. They are amazing. They have completely revamped and changed the way I do a lot of things. So one of the things that hyperdocs are built for is if you have a particular section of your class that just sucks away teaching time and I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but something you just hate teaching because it sucks the life out of you. Um, do it in a hyperdoc. And then it frees you up as a teacher to actually go around and support the student, student by student, and help them out. And it allows your students to work at their own speed. Now, if I'm confusing you, go to gavinzo.com slash hyper, and it is going to allow you into... Oh, I need access to my hyperdoc. I thought I set that up the right way. All right, well, I'll fix that in a second. But my hyperdoc that I am creating is a... Oh, I shouldn't do that. Here we go. So... Sorry for that. So my hyperdoc that I will figure out how to share in just a second... Looks like this. And I picked one of my least favorite parts of the school year, which is getting my students to choose their first instrument. I see my kids 40 minutes a week. That means it takes me the better part of a month for my students to choose their instruments. Because one class is like introducing them to the instruments. One class is showing it to them. One class is getting them to sort of explore and wander around. One class is getting the kids to log into the Google and you know, do the form. Like it takes a month to get instruments out to these kids. So I thought I'm going to hyperdoc this thing. So here's what a hyperdoc is. And I'm trying to explain it real quick because I'm running out of time, but it's a curated document with links, with assignments for the kids and with things that you need them to do. 
So I'm going to go through it real fast. Step one, watch this five minute YouTube video on why playing an instrument is important to you. Because how many students have come to you on that first day and go, I don't want to do this. This sucks. This is dumb. Music is stupid. So why are you learning music? Not just because I told you to, but because this video explains why it's so important. Number two, you already saw my YouTube playlist. Go and watch lesson one on each of these instruments. Now what I want you to do after you've watched that is go to YouTube yourself and find one video of each instrument doing something that you think is cool and paste it into this Google Doc. And you know what? I don't really care what it is. I'm not going to grade it. If my student finds a video of a kid showing his flute up his nose and he thinks that's cool, you know what? He took the time to Google flute cool and curated their own links and found something they found interesting. I just need to know they can surf the internet and that they've given the instrument some thought. And if they don't know how to do this assignment, I've put a how-to video link right there in that part of the, of the HyperDoc. Click right here to see how to do the assignment and they can watch the video of how to do it. Next step, here's a longer video on things to think about before you choose your instrument. Do you live in an apartment? Do you live with small children or old people? Do you take the bus? Can you, do you ride a bike to school? Can you carry this instrument home physically? Can you, can you, can you? All these things to think about when they're borrowing instruments. And then once you've watched that, go to the Google form and select your instrument for this school year. This is the important part of the HyperDoc. It's the thing that I really need them to do. So I've got it in red and I've got it really important for them. Yellow, and this was my own personal favorite. Because again, after students have their first instrument and you're working on those first few days, how many questions do you have to field that you want to stab yourself in the brain with of kids that can't figure out how to use the instrument for the first time? So I said, I want every student to go into, if you chose the alto saxophone, go into this padlet here, and all the first year alto saxophone players are going to build information that a beginning saxophone player may find important. How to assemble your saxophone. What an alto saxophone fingering chart looks like. How to put your read on um, perfect. Here's some of our favorite songs that we are watching. So my students are going in and curating their own help file, how to play the alto saxophone. My reflect section, I want the students to go into Flipgrid and record a video telling me why they should get their first choice of instrument. I may not even watch them all, but you know what? Every test I'm going to do this year uses Flipgrid, so I need to make sure that my students know how to log in and use the program. So even if my student gives me this really heartfelt, impassioned speech about why they should get to play the clarinet, I mean, I'll probably give it to them anyway. But even if I don't, I know they know how to use Flipgrid. So when I go to test one, I don't have to waste the whole day showing them how to use the program. And then my extend section, if there's kids that are done their work early, why don't you go back up to the apply section and add a few more things to that Padlet if, to, you, know, if you have some time. And what used to take me four classes, I do this in two. And I don't have to do hardly anything other than circulate around the room and make sure my students are watching the videos appropriately or they're getting the must-dos done that are built into this. And my students just work at their own speed. Some do it for homework. Some do it in class. And then at the end of two classes, I can hand the video, uh, instruments out and I'm ready to go. That is a hyperdoc. All right. Oops, wrong button. Okay, so I have talked today about a lot of things. I've talked about Flipgrid, Screencastify, School Video Recorder for Google Drive, Unscreen, Google Classroom, Google Sites, and HyperDocs. If you would like to learn more about any of those things, you got it right. There's a Gab session on that. So anywhere you click here, you click on Flipgrid, you're going to get to my Gab about using Flipgrid. You want to learn more about using Unscreen? Click there and go to my Gab session. All of these links here will take you to a Gab session that explains in detail how to use all of these programs. If you've never used them before, my session today didn't really show you how to use them because there's a Gab session you can watch that's all how to. I got one minute left. I'm almost there. This broadcast tonight is going to be recorded and going to be available on the Global GEG YouTube channel. So if you missed this tonight, or if you have a friend that wanted to be here that couldn't, you can just direct them to our YouTube channel to watch. And before I let you go, I do have a link right here. 
It is gavinza.com slash, I think it's called VidCert. It's the last one on my list. There it is. Uh, and if you go there, that's going to give you a certificate for being here today. It's gonna You're going to fill out your name, your email address, and I'm going to email you a certificate for your time tonight. Also, if you can take the time and fill out gavinza.com slash feedback, it will take you to my feedback form, which looks like this. Really quickly, you can haze me, you can praise me, you can tell me what you want to see in your next Gav session. And the best part is, is all you have to do is fill it out and click submit. And I will give you access to a Google Drive full of literally thousands of freebies and giveaways. These are things like lesson plans, templates, uh, backdrops, uh, hyperdocs, all kinds of stuff. And they are all yours for free just for filling out my feedback form. There is also a global GEG feedback form that they are going to be talking about as well. All right. I have been talking for a whole hour and 30 seconds. So I am going to sign off. Thank you so much for being here today, everybody. Again, my name is Gavin Foster. You can follow me at Gav Session. Thank you so much for being here tonight and have a fantastic evening.